Christina, thank you very much uh, for joining me uh, from Washington in my uh, show uh, Labyrinth. Thank you so much. I know uh, you have a lot of work and you're busy uh, during uh, the summit. Uh, thanks again for finding time uh, to talk to, uh, to me. So let's start uh, with what was going on in this uh, past few days uh, in uh, Washington. Uh, what were the keynotes uh, in the during uh, the summit? Uh, we heard from the media that the focus was uh, Ukraine and uh, the war in Ukraine and the Russian aggression there. Pleasure to be with you, Christina. Thank you for this invitation. Indeed, in Washington, the main focus uh, is and was Ukraine for uh, these days of uh, the anniversary summit uh, of uh, the North Atlantic Alliance. Uh, to quote the Secretary General that uh, held yet another press conference uh, yesterday evening, because the Secretary General being in charge of uh, oh, hosting the summit he basically talks with media uh, every day for a few uh, few times a day he said uh, the aid for ukraine is the most urgent task at this summit so um, everything happening at the, the uh, anniversary nato summit here in washington uh, has anything to do with helping ukraine but not only ukraine uh, also uh, enhancing the uh, 360 uh, air degrees defense of nato especially air defense and uh, when we talk about that we talk about mainly the eastern flank being so close to ukraine and being closer to russia uh, the fact that russia remains the most a uh, major threat for uh, everyone here in the alliance and the fact that let's not not forget and to repeat over and over again that Russians started the war in Ukraine and uh, there, uh, there seems to be no uh, intention to stop it so far. Uh, so coming back to Washington, the leaders our um, intention is to help Ukraine even more to show that uh, NATO still stands with Ukraine as long as it takes and more than that because today we also have the final declaration of the NATO summit. Uh, there are a lot of points uh, making references to uh, helping Ukraine. And also it's a personal dream of Secretary Stoltenberg because uh, he will be ending this year his 10 uh, years long mandate uh, as uh, Secretary General of NATO. He is um, uh, intending to, to have a pledge uh, for um, um, found for Ukraine, uh, each of the allies member should apply to this uh, to this found according to their own PIB, but also to take into account the fact that uh, each of us contributed to uh, helping Ukraine and helping more Ukraine. So it's a lot about Ukraine. President Zelensky was also here. Uh, let's not forget that at the beginning of this uh, summit, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and the Russians attacked a uh, children's hospital in Kiev, and that uh, was uh, stated in many declarations here, was condemned here in, in Washington and also by, uh, of course, President uh, Zelensky. Uh, when we talk about uh, Putin, he is in his diplomatic uh, di diplomatic search for new uh, for for new alliances. Uh, so uh, he met uh, also with uh, Chinese uh, official, uh, with uh, Hungarian official, with uh, Serbian uh, here. Uh, but uh, what what I had uh, occasion to to hear from from your reportings there is that Stoltenberg also addressed uh, China as an issue and um, he said that it is a decisive enabler of the war so uh, what are, what are uh, the, the talks and the keynotes uh, about china's influence in the war in ukraine well you are right. China is also mentioned in the final declaration here in the summit of Washington, uh, saying that China is indeed the main enabler. Uh, a power like China should not um, enable uh, the war, uh, more war in Europe uh, is uh, part of this uh, quote in the final declaration um, of the uh, summit in Washington. And of course, China remains the systemic uh, challenger for uh, NATO because China now is much more present and even in Europe, let's not forget that in these days, while in Washington, uh, the allies uh, have the summit uh, in Belarus, uh, China uh, brought some uh, with military to have exercises, common exercises with the Belarusian uh, army. So uh, China and 
and this um, uh, partnership without limits, uh, as we remember, uh, both uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping called their friendship is something that actually helps Russia to keep more the, of the, the war. And not only China, uh, unfortunately, is not mentioned yet in the uh, final declaration here in Washington, but uh, India is also uh, an, uh, a country that helps quite a lot uh, the um, uh, struggle of Russia to maintain this war uh, by supporting its economy. And uh, we can understand the play of, uh, of India, but then again, we cannot agree with the play of India. So, so it's a lot of um, uh, coming and going in, in this regard, because let's not forget NATO is the strongest alliance that could be uh, at this moment uh, in the uh, planet Earth. Uh, and in the same time, we have uh, on the other side uh, of, the, of the world, we have uh, Russia plus China. Uh, plus Iran, plus North Korea, that wants to um, um, step on all the values that NATO believes in and all the values that all the allies support. Christina, before uh, the summit, uh, Hungarian uh, Prime Minister, uh, he went uh, to the tour, he actually tried to, to impose himself as, um, as a peace uh, solver, peace bringer or war, war solver. Uh, however, you want, he went to visit uh, the President Zelensky in Kiev and then he went to, to visit, uh, uh, to visit uh, President uh, Putin. Uh, so is there any talks during the summit about his behavior between, uh, with, between NATO member representatives who are there on the forum, uh, how they uh, actually see on this, uh, on this moves, on Orban's moves? They don't like it and they mention it because uh, even at the, during this summit, uh, Viktor Orban, um, this time with the voice of his uh, foreign minister, Peter Siarto, uh, mentioned that uh, Ukraine does not belong in NATO. On the other hand, we see in the final declaration of the uh, summit here in Washington that uh, all the allies uh, supported the idea of the irreversible way of Ukraine towards NATO. Uh, Viktor Orban, uh, effect of a pacifier, and I quote on quote on that, is that after his visit in, uh, in Moscow, Putin attacked uh, China hospital in Kiev. So that's the influence of Viktor Orban when it comes to making peace in Ukraine, when it comes to uh, stopping uh, Putin to keep on attacking Ukraine. So Viktor Orban has no influence to make it brief and to make it clear. And when it comes to the alliance, uh, all the allies uh, underline his uh, role that basically didn't bring any good to, to anything. And more than that, Viktor Orban is still defying everyone because after the uh, NATO summit will be ending uh, on Monday uh, in the United States, the Republican uh, convention is starting in order to uh, nominate Donald Trump as the, um, the, the Republican candidate for the uh, president of the United States. Uh, but Donald Trump is meeting uh, um, Orban uh, on Tuesday, so immediately after this um, important Republican congression, uh, his convention, simply because uh, Viktor Orban wants to underline more and more that uh, he is the one of the EU leaders that um, uh, likes the vision of Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump has its own vision when it comes to Ukraine about uh, uh, how uh, this war should end. Uh, most of, uh, of the allies here do not agree with uh, Mr. Trump uh, visions. And Donald Trump also brings today uh, something new to the uh, allies' uh, attention, saying that if he becomes president of the United States, we know already that he is not a big fan of, uh, of the North Atlantic Alliance, uh, he, one of the measures he intends to do is to share with the allies less and less intelligence information. And we do remember how important are the intelligence coming from the United States. Only if we think of the days before the Russians started the war in Ukraine, when the entire planet basically find out uh, from the um, in U.S. intelligence services that the Russians are going to uh, to create this attack. So that would be a, a big blow for the alliance if Trump is uh, going to do this to to make it uh, a real thing. If, of course, first of all, uh, he has to to take over the the uh, job of the president for the second mandate. 
Listen, I want to ask you uh, some information about uh, my country, about uh, North uh, Macedonia. The delegations and the leaders are using uh, the summit uh, to, to make uh, connections, to make new connections, to straighten uh, the, old, uh, the old connections they have. Uh, throughout uh, uh, meetings all day long. So we were speculating here in Macedonia and in Greece as well, whether there will be unofficial meeting between uh, our uh, leader uh, Mitskoski and uh, Greek leader Mitsotakis. So did uh, that happen? What, uh, what are your informations uh, saying about uh, this possible meeting? Uh, anything is possible at the NATO summit because you are perfectly right. The, the leaders are here. Uh, they are in the same room and, uh, and uh, a bilateral meeting could happen anytime, uh, even if it's not on the original agenda. For the moment, as far as I know, because I asked around, uh, I, apparently there was not such a meeting, but the day here in Washington, while we do this broadcast, uh, is uh, barely starting. So. So it's uh, the last day of the summit and could be uh, such a, a meeting today. But what I want to mention when it comes to the Western Balkans, because this region is extremely important. And I guess being a, a journalist from Romania, I know um, I know a little better about uh, about this region because Romania is a big supporter of the Western Balkans. Uh, NATO uh, declaration uh, summit also involves um, a specific point addressed to the Western Balkans, saying how important is this region and saying that uh, NATO wants to enlarge um, uh, itself with countries from uh, from this region, from this uh, area, simply because it cannot be a gap when it comes to Europe and when it comes to, as I said, this 360 degrees um, um, defense, air defense of Europe and the North Atlantic Alliance. So the Western Balkans are important also for NATO. Let's just hope that there will be a, a meeting be between the North Macedonian leader and the uh, leader of, uh, of Greece uh, here in, uh, in uh, Washington. For the moment, I have no, uh, uh, a, no idea if this happened, but uh, fingers crossed. Mr. Vasquez, thank you very much for accepting uh, this interview. Uh, these days, these past few weeks or maybe months, it was very interesting uh, to follow up the friends, uh, the politics uh, in France. Uh, so you had elections uh, during the first round. Uh, everything looked like the far right is going to win the election. Uh, they came out first after the first uh, cycle, uh, but there was a huge turn over uh, in the second cycle of the voting and actually the far right from the first place they went down to to the third uh, uh, place so uh, first of all I would like to ask uh, how this happened what happened in that period of time uh, during between two, two, two election cycles uh, to have this kind of, of turnover and, or this kind of change yeah First of all, I would like to thank you for, for having me and it's very interesting to, to discuss about that because it's a very brand new situation for us. And I would like to first introduce myself, uh, of course, so I'm, I'm, I'm a parliamentary collaborator of a uh, uh, French uh, member of the Parliament, the National Assembly uh, from the Macron's party, uh, Renaissance. Uh, since four years, and before that, I was uh, living in North Macedonia uh, in the international cooperation field, and also I founded the, the French Macedonia Association uh, while I was there. So I'm, I'm very glad to to express uh, my views uh, for your channel. Uh, so actually, yeah, what you mentioned is is the the big surprise of this uh, election. Uh, so the first surprise was of course the dissolution uh, that uh, our president Emmanuel Macron decided on the 9th of June. Uh, at the night of the results of the European elections. So he wanted to give uh, democratic respiration uh, to clarify the situation. And what we see is that, the, I don't know if the, the situation is clarified, it is clarified because uh, French people uh, uh, voted, so they expressed what they, 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 they would like. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this leads in a very uh, new and, uh, uh, if I may say, innovative situation of our parliament, uh, because uh, right now we have like three big blocks as you say, uh, that's the outcome of the election. So left uh, a coalition, 
central coalition and uh, extreme right uh, plus then right uh, bloc. Um, so actually, yes, the, 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 the surprise was from the, the second uh, round. And this uh, is the result of what we call the Republican Front, uh, which means that uh, due to the rise of the Marine Le Pen's party, which is extreme right, and uh, many candidates that uh, arrived in the third position decided not to maintain themselves for the second round. And this is how we vote here. Actually, each MP is uh, representing uh, his or her constituency. So we have uh, 577 constituencies, which is 577 MPs. And uh, each uh, constituency has its own uh, specific case. So in the case of uh, a party member from the left uh, coalition or uh, the uh, central coalition came coming on the third position. Uh, he, he was supposed to uh, retire for the second round. So that's what happened in, let's say, uh, most of the cases. So that is why, actually, uh, Marine Le Pen's candidate uh, did not uh, manage to arrive uh, at the, the issue of, uh, after the second round as high as it was expected, because uh, it is notable to see that uh, her party got 11 million votes, which is historically high and which is like top votes of the country. But because of, of the um, the management, uh, the electoral system and rules for these parliamentary elections, she has not been able to overcome uh, the, the issue of the, the voting system. Uh, despite the fact that her party is uh, still number one in the French parliament, it is not the first coalition. That's notable because... Uh, we work for uh, the elections within coalitions, but then when the parliament is functioning, we work with groups, right? So that, that is like the, 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 the current discussion that we are having in the parliament is uh, which group will uh, have each seats at the parliament. So we have discussions currently at the parliament. Uh, and um, right now, like uh, Marine Le Pen's group is clear. We have the list. So they are about 145. And then uh, the central group, which is belonging to uh, Emmanuel Macron's analyse, is still discussing. Uh, but they won about 165 uh, seats in total. And then the left uh, coalition is also discussing about their groups. And they won about 185 seats. So that's where we stand right now. Uh, what was the what was the the, the public uh, speech, uh, the public discourse uh, after the second round of of election? What was the analysis in media? Was that uh, greeted by the majority of French people? Yes. So uh, let's say that there were also concerns, of course, on the extreme left uh, coalition as well, because uh, one party, which is La France Insoumise, led by Jean Luc Mélenchon is a uh, very extreme left and it was belonging to this left coalition and also there have been like some cases of uh, anti-semitism uh, uh, speeches and actions in this party so some people were also uh, having uh, uh, favoring uh, uh, la france insoumise uh, leaning power as well or, or at least getting high in in the seats so the fear is in both uh, sides i would like to mention that otherwise about the public uh, opinion and expression uh, and, and reactions right now that the election is done is that once again, we can consider that we have three almost equal blocks, which is absolutely new to our country. And our constitution wasn't made, our institutions were not made for that. It always been like in North Macedonia, working with left and right, then Emmanuel Macron's uh, uh, leading uh, uh, presidentials in 2027 changed the rule, uh, even though he had the majority, even though in 20, 20, 2022, he had the relative majority, we've been more or less able to function as such. But right now we have three blocks, so we do not know exactly how to function because that means that if not a single party or group got the absolute majority or even relative majority, uh, close to the uh, uh, absolute majority, which is two, eight, nine and six, uh, this means that they will need to discuss and to make compromises between each between each other. So that's what I think like people would expect is that this this election is the outcome of a really very historically high level of participation. So we have here, uh, a, a, let's say, a very clear view, and that's maybe the clarification that Emmanuel Macron was uh, expecting. We have a clear view of the political uh, field situation representation of France, right? So as you can see, it's quite diverse. It's quite eclectic, if I may say. So what people expect now is for all this, if the people and groups to work together. 
at the same time, it's very surprising because yesterday we got a new poll from a lab uh, saying that uh, they've been asked about the coalitions. Would they would like to see the centrist and the right working together? Would they like to see centrist plus right plus left working together? And the same situation, actually, like no single coalition uh, uh, got, gets more than 50 percent adhesion of the, the of the people, you know, so we don't really know exactly uh, which coalition uh, will work together or be able to work together and what the French people expect from which coalition working together, actually. So I, I just think like, like, once again, in so many countries, like groups and coalitions are able to merge and work together. Here, we don't have this tradition of, of making compromises between groups and blocs. So right now, they are, dis they are having discussions, the new elected members of parliament uh, and groups, whether and how they could work together. But so far, what we can see is that they are not willing to work together. Like the left coalition says, we want to apply only our program. The right party said, like, we will not work with anyone else. Uh, the extreme right are like, we have the majority, I mean, we have the highest number of seats, so it is le more legitimate for us to have the power. And the central party right now is reduced, even though uh, the president is central. We may have uh, uh, the situation that happened by the past, once again, of having the president of one party and the parliament from another party. But once again, the, the majority was clear at the parliament. This is not the case. So the discussions are ongoing. The groups are currently forming at the parliament. So we don't know we had the, the outcome of the, the, the of the negotiations, but the public opinion is about that. It's very diverse. So uh, in all of this, uh, in all of this situation after the European election, maybe even before the European election, because it was also uh, a huge uh, campaigns in all of the countries, member uh, countries of the European Union. So and of course in European Union there there is also a turn. Uh, turnover in a way because there is a, a rise of <clears throat> uh, of far right. So did that anyhow influence the, uh, the opinion of the people uh, about the, the voting inside the country, inside in, in France? Or there is some uh, satisfaction or unsatisfaction even prior to, to European uh, Union election process? Well, <clears throat> I would say that um, since 2022, uh, since the outcome of the first parliamentary elections, we saw that uh, once again, the, 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 the presidential party did not gain the absolute majority. So that was a first sign of the French people towards the president Macron, which was uh, you have now to be able to, 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 to make coalitions together, to find agreements together with other parties, because no, we are not giving you the absolute majority. And let's say that this did not really happen. There have been some attempts, but like a consensus has have not been found for so many uh, uh, bills uh, during this time, during this last two years. And uh, with the government had to, to, to and, and, and the prime minister uh, at the time, uh, most of all, Isabel Bond, had to uh, adopt bills, to make adopting bills by using uh, the article 49.3 uh, of the constitutions, which says like uh, the bills adopted without the vote of the parliamentary members, but we give our responsibility uh, back to you. So uh, there's been some votes, uh, which we call motion de censure, uh, which uh, the, the DMPs decide to make the government fail down or not. And one attempt was uh, got failed by only nine votes, which was very short. So we could see since 2022 that there's been some instability in the parliamentary process. And that is why Emmanuel Macron wanted a clarification Right, because he saw that like uh, the, at the European elections, his party was uh, coming on the third position quite low, and so he said, "Let's clarify all this." As we just say, like the clarification is not that clear actually. It's once again a very new situation, so it will all depend on what will happen in the next months. All, all about the negotiations, the coalitions. Maybe it will not happen. Maybe we'll, no no party will will manage to find a coalition to to find discussions together. Maybe we'll have to reform even the constitutions. Who knows? Really, this is a real momentum in the po French politics, and that's what makes it very interesting. At the same time, we can see that it has some repercussions on the European level, as you said, uh, because uh, our party, uh, the, the, the Renew Party of the European Parliament, uh, got back. Uh, got lower in its importance because we lost uh, MPs uh, from 23 to 13. And at the same time, we can see that um, 
the Marine Serpents Party, a coalition of the European Parliament, decided to make a new uh, party with Orbán's uh, MPs and allies, which gives a clear uh, uh, a clear uh, movement of what she's expecting, right? And she's getting further uh, from the Republic. She's getting closer, let's say, to Russia and 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 to to her allies. So this is very clear. This this is a political clarification. That's what we got. Like during the campaign, also during only three weeks of campaign, we've got like so many events happening within the political parties themselves. We saw the right wing, Le, Le Republicain. Uh, 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 we saw their president making a separation, a coalition, an agreement with Marine Le Pen party, which was would never happen before. Uh, at the same time, within uh, Eric Zemmour, which is very extreme right wing, Eric Zemmour's party, we saw a couple of members, uh, newly elected European members of parliament, uh, leaded by uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, uh, getting back to the Rassemblement National, which is Marine Le Pen party. Uh, we saw this coalition of all left-wing parties making getting together once again. There has been an attempt already in 2022. It worked only for the election. During the session, they separated in groups. This most likely will happen once again within this new legislature. We don't know yet, but most likely, because we understood that it was just a coalition for an electoral coalition. And uh, Macron apparently did not expect these left coalitions to get back so quick together altogether, uh, despite uh, their clear difference in their work, in their opinions, in their programs, but they, they, they've they done it, right? So once again, like this is in a way the clarification that the president was talking about about, let's say, uh, masks that are uh, getting down. <laughs> so that's, that makes it more clear for the French people as well. No, sega ke podiskutirame po konkretno so mojata denešna gostinka od Institutot za evropska politika, Beba Žagar, malko po suštinski za ono što se slučuva vo Unijata i za ono što ke se slučuva, odnosno što ne čeka pred nas, a malko i ke se navratime na nekoj fundamentalni čovekovi prava povrzani so Unijata. Žagar, bi blagodaram što odvojivte vreme i što dojdovte vo studijoto na medijatak. Ви благодарам и на вас за поканата. Институтот за европска политика на вистина е среќен кога има интерес и од медиумите и од јавноста и нормално од граѓаните да слушнат за да слушнат за неговата работа и за начинот на кој што ние би сакале да го приближиме процесот на пристапување кон Европската унија. Тогму така ние целиме кон Европска унија очигледен е интересот за Европската унија, но кога се работи за процесот на пристапување и на нашите обврски, многу мал број од граѓаните всушност ги прочитале сите оние легислативи, сите оние документи на кои што ќе треба ние да се прилагодиме, но за ова малку подоцна ќе ве прашам, ќе влеземе со вашиот последен настан, вие изминатата недела организиравте една голема конференција, форум Европеум, на кој што се дискутира, се дискутираше за неколку важни работи. А тоа се механизмите за владеење на правото на ЕУ, планот за раст. Ајде да почнеме малку од почеток. Имавте гости од други балкански држави, исто од држави претенденти да влезат во Европската унија. Да почнеме прво со владењето на, на, на правото. Што се случува во оваа сфера и докаде се балканските држави а, во процесот на прилагодување, па и на преведување, и на усогласување а, со легислативата на Европската унија? А, така, форум Европеум е годишна конференција која што Институтот за европска политика ја а, организира секоја година во рамки на проектот Градиме мостови за заедничка и дни на владеење на правото во поглед на пристапувањето во Европската унија. А, идејата за оваа конференција е да се даде, баш како што гласи самиот наслов, форум за дискусија а, за процесот на пристапување на Европската унија на, кандида... на земјите кандидатки. И оваа година а, темата по-конкретно на оваа конференција беше инструментите на владеење на правото во поглед на пристапувањето во Европската унија. Па од тука првиот панел се фокусираше конкретно на владеењето на правото, што го начнавте како тема, односно инструментите кои што истојат на располагање на Европската унија во рамки на тој така наречен тулбокс, 
односно алатките кои што се превентивни и корективни, а се поврзани со владењето на правото во земјите членки. Е сега тоа што ние го разговаравме во првиот панел е дека заедно со нашите гости кои што доаѓаат од земјите од Западен Балкан, но имавме представници од Европскиот економски и социјален комитет, дека владењето на правото е темелна вредност на Европската унија, која што треба да биде сочувана не само во земјите членки на Европската унија, туку и да се стремат и земјите кандидатки да ја оствара ова вредност уште пред нивното пристапување. Оно што ми остана мена како интересно од еден од говорниците беше дека треба да направиме што е можно повеќе во оваа фаза додека сме земји кандидатки уште пред да се стекнеме со членство во Европската унија. Значи ние да се фокусираме на внатрешните реформи, да станеме што е можно подобар кандидат. А дури потоа кога ќе станеме земја членка да видиме до каде сме со тие предизвици во област на владењето на правото со кои што и сега ден денес земји членки се соочува. Но дел од овие од овие реформи кои што треба да ги спроведаме, всушност се и услов пред пред процесот на на пристапување. На што беше конкретно ставен акцент од кога зборуваме за владење на правото бидејќи тоа е малку по широка тема. Така, тоа е многу широка тема која што обфаќа повеќе области и правосудството и борбата против корупцијата и темелните права. А, оно што а, беше по-конкретно разговарано е како оние превентивни механизми, како што е, на пример, Европскиот механизам за владеење на правото, се применува во сегашните земји членки, како и неговата примена во а, неколку земји кандидатки. Значи, почнувајќи од оваа година, од ова лето, четири земји кандидатки, Албанија, Северна Македонија, а, Србија и Црнагора, а, ке бидат дел од тој а, механизам за владење на правото, односно секој од нив ке добие а, извештај за земјата, а, во кој што Европската комисија ке даде своја оценка за состојбите за владење на правото во овие а, земји кандидатки. Овие извештаи се одржат четири столба, значи столбовите се фокусирани на правосудството, борбата против корупцијата, медиумите и слободата на изразување, како и институционалните а, checks and balances, значи а, рамнотежата и проверката на институциите помеѓу себе. А, идејата е дека односно тоа што поконкретно го разговаравме е дека ова е добра иницијатива за да им се даде шанса на земјите кандидатки да бидат на исто рамниште со земјите членки, добра вежба за нас в сушност, а, за да видиме што точно на чека еден ден кога ќе станеме полноправни членки на Унијата. Првите две работи кои ги споменавте, тоа се правосудството и корупцијата, или ќе ги спојме во едно, корупцијата во правосудството може би е ракрана на македонското Обштество, тоа е она од кое што не можеме да се избавиме децени и на назад. Какви се состојбите во регионот, со, со што се пофалија, ако можам така да кажам, останатите три држави претенденти? И направите ли една анализа или еден впечаток кој докаде во тој пат? Ние се сеќаваме на почетокот кога ја подпишавме она спогодба за стабилизација и асоцијација, бевме на еден ранг заедно со, со Хрватска на патот кон Европската унија за години и години подоцна да се вратиме неколку чекори на назад. Каков е вашиот став за тоа? Направивте ли а, некаква анализа, било што за тоа, зошто сме уназадени, каде сме сега и а, каде се другите наши соседи во овој пат? А, тоа што можеше да се заклучи од првиот панел, на кој што имавме и представник од друга земја кандидатка, од Босна и од земја членка од Хрватска, а, беше дека дури и кога земјите стануваат полноправни членки на Унијата, не се надминуваат сите предизвици, вклучително и оние предизвици во правосудството и корупцијата, како што споменавте во правосудството. А, значи, не може да се донесе заклучок дека Самото членство наједнаш ќе ги реши сите проблеми. Се уште се соочуваме со одредени проблеми, на пример, во а, поглед на независноста на судството, во поглед на партизираността и во поглед на корупцијата во правосудството, во одредени земји членки, како што е Унгарија, како што е Бугарија, Романија. А, така што заклучокот не беше тој што го спомнав, дека континуирано треба да се работи на овие реформи, без разлика во која фаза сте вие од 
procesot na pristapuvanje i posle stanuvanje na polnopravna zemja členka. Kaj nas, to što го имаме анализирано како института дека и покрај тоа што Судскиот совет многу рано е воведен во 2005 година, не може да се каже дека да, ние сме имале реформи и со самото воспоставување на Судскиот совет идејата било да се воспостави еден независен орган во правосудството, кој што ќе го ослободи судството судиите од надворешни влијанија, од партизација, од поларизација. А меѓутоа и покрај а, две децении, речи се две децении поминати од неговото формирање, не може да се каже дека ние го имаме решено проблемот на независност на правосудството и на корупција, видно од а, скорешните случаи на а, висока корупција од последниве неколку години и начинот на кој што тие случаи се решаваат. А така што Факт е дека се потребни реформи повторно и факт е дека и самата Европска унија, кога ги гледа своите алатки што ги има а, во поглед на владењето на правото, таа ги ревидира, го следи нивниот ефект и кога ќе види дека има потреба од новини и измени, таа ги прави тие измени. Па мислам дека истото и ние како земја кандидатка треба да го земеме во предвид како пример, дека не е доволно само еднаш да воспоставите една институција и да речете готово завршивме воспоставивме независност во правосудството, туку треба континуирано да се следи работата на таа институција и да видиме каде може да се направат промени за да се подобри. Особено ако и таа институција е подложна на влијание. Така е.